Hello, thanks for joining us. My name is Stephanie Patel, and uh, this is the beginning of what we hope will be a continuous conversation. We're going to call it A New Conversation Has Begun. And we think it's time. We think it's time that we address the issues in this world from a new direction. We've been taking the same old path for a long time. And as we look around, we see how, in many ways, it's just not working. You know, there's a, an old saying that doing the same thing over and over and hoping for a different result is insanity. So now it's time to get sane. So I would like to introduce my co-host here, Amy Fulmer who has written a book. Do you want to hold your book up, Amy? Sure. Don't Trip Potato Chip. And I'm going to let her tell you a little bit about her book, why she was inspired to write it, and why she's inspired to participate with me in this talk show. Go ahead, Amy. Well, Stephanie, thank you for having me on. Um, this is really important. Well, be sure that you understand I'm not just having you on. You're going to be working with me. Okay. I'm in. I'm in. Good. Uh, four and a half years ago, yesterday, my 19-year-old son died from a drug overdose. And to say the least, that's the moment my life 100% changed. The old Amy actually died too, and then a new Amy was born. So my journey over the past four and a half years has been learn how, A, how can I heal myself? And how can I look for my son where he is now, not where he was? Okay? Mm -hmm. I'm following you. So it was a grueling, grueling journey that was and continues to be littered with jewels and blessings um, that I can't even begin to describe. So what happened was, um, just to recap quickly, after he died, in my life, Stephanie, in my life, and I was not young, I was not a young mother, I had never experienced pain on a level. It, it, to this day, it is unbelievable to me what parents live through. I didn't know the human soul could absorb that amount of pain. So my body tried to die twice after my son died. And he came to me in a vision, and this was all new to me, and showed me a picture of him shaking his head. And then I heard his voice and he said, no, mom, I'll be very upset if you come here now. It's not your time. So these visions have happened before, Stephanie. I'm not the first person. But for me, it was my first time of anything like that. So I understood on a core level that my time was not to go. And I was disappointed because I was ready to go. I wasn't technically suicidal, clinically not so, but I was ready to go. And I would have gone in a heartbeat if my son had said, okay, mom, come on, I'm here. I, I wouldn't be having this conversation with you. So as I was recovering from these illnesses that I had, um, I started to journal because I was desperate. I couldn't contain my pain. And I started just writing and writing my kind of my story. And then when I read back and looked at the notes, I was like, wow, no one said this before. Because I had a huge outpouring of people that sent me bereavement books. And there are many beautiful bereavement books out there, Stephanie. But it's not about rainbows and butterflies, what I'm talking about, especially in the early days. So I wrote a book that's not rainbows and butterflies. It's really not. It is a brutal account of how I went from hanging on for my life, and I mean hanging on for my life, to I'm going to be as bold to say this right now, and this is going to shock mothers I'm actually starting to thrive in a way I had no idea. 
that is the story that needs to start to connect to parents. A caveat, when I mention mothers, I understand that we're including fathers in this, but I'm not a father. Um, I'm an expert at mother's grief because I birthed and carried a child, I buried a child. Men process pain entirely differently, and I haven't accessed that portion yet, and that's a journey I'm looking forward to because they function very differently. So when I say mothers, it's not like I'm excluding fathers. I can only speak from my vantage point as a subject matter expert, which is the bereavement process of a mother. So I want to be real, real clear on that. Mm -hmm. The other thing that needs to be said that I wanted to first start this segment off with is it came to my attention this week. Um, I, I can't even believe this. You know, when a wife loses a husband, she's called a widow. When a husband loses a wife, um, they're called a widower. Mm -hmm. When a child loses a parent or parents, they're orphans. Right. right. When a mother or father loses a child, there's no name. Right. That's very interesting, Amy. I hadn't even I hadn't even realized that or thought about that. That's that's a fascinating comment on the way we see things. Well, it it stopped me dead in my tracks. Um I I was staggered. And then because of the implications of that I had to think about for about three days because that's so telling about how, and this is not just the United States. My work is now being followed, Stephanie, as of this morning in 50 countries across the globe. It transcends race, color, creed, religion. I don't care if you pray. I don't care who you pray to. I don't, I don't, it doesn't matter if your, you know, son or daughter is in an ISIS situation and they kill a bunch of people and then die. That mother hurts right so yes. this is not about religion race or color it's every parent globally and in my wildest dreams i never thought since my work went out february of this year today would be followed in 50 countries i am staggered i i am staggered so when i heard about there's no name the implications of that we could have 30 shows on because that's so telling of where the death cooties, the death cooties comes in. Parents who are bereaved are really the largest, most misunderstood segment of the global population in my estimation. I'm estimating, but I'll bet you I'm right. And that's why we're talking today. That's why I wrote my book. And that's one of my missions. Well. You know, Amy, I had never even thought about that, and that's true. And so um, I should put in here, too, that say that I also lost a son at the age of 23. You, you were 23 or your son was 23? My son was 23. Okay. okay. I also lost a baby at birth who was stillborn because of a knot in the umbilical cord. Um, so I have also been through that grief process. And as you say, I, I know you said that, and I think it's very fair for you to say this, I really do, that you can only speak for the grieving mother, for your experience as a grieving mother. And, you know, perhaps all grieving mothers don't have the same experience or all mothers who've lost their children. It is, there are certainly similarities that run through it. I also lost a father when I was a child and a brother. Okay. So the, the loss of someone in my life has been a theme. I've lost two sisters. Mm -hmm. The day that wow. my son died, my nephew also died. Oh, Stephanie, wow. Of different things, separate things, my sister's son. Right, right, right. And so I'm very familiar with grief, if, if, you know, from different points of view. And I think what you're talking about is very real, that 
there are lots of books about bereavement. There really is a gap in understanding the, the effect of the loss of a child on a mother, on a parent, obviously, but on a mother. And I wonder, Amy, I'm thinking about it, and I'm wondering if part of it isn't that. We're in kind of a new era. Mm -hmm. you yeah, know, we are. My mother yeah. had 15 children. Mm -hmm. And her mother had six children, or seven children, I don't recall how many. And her husband and her son were killed in a cave-in when they were digging coal in western North Dakota. And she remarried. Her mother, my mother's mother, my grandmother, uh, mm -hmm. that I never met. Uh, and she remarried to a man who was a widower and had six or seven children. And in total, they had 23 children. Whoa. Wow. And I think in the past, it was kind of expected, you know, you hoped all your children would live to grow up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But so many didn't. You could, there's tons of examples. Abraham Lincoln, you know, lost right. children who never grew up. Thomas right. Jefferson had six children by his first wife, or his wife. He had many other children by his, his slave uh, mistress, but he had six children by his wife, and four of them died. You know, two, yeah. four of them did not survive early childhood, you know. Right. It, so it right. was sort of a, a fact of life, if you will. Mm -hmm. exactly children that infant mortality was high and perhaps that lies under this idea that there is no word for a grieving mother well yeah, yeah I mean that really resonates with me Stephanie because when you look back at history you know history always gives us in the rearview mirror the how we got from here to there okay mm -hmm. that makes total total sense to me um, during those days, we were in survival mode. It was survival of the species. That's why they had so many kids. They figured, well, if a few die, then we got a few left over. You know, I mean, it was really much more of a, a primitive type of concept. However, I'll, plus, I'll, plus, I just have to say, plus there was no birth, effective birth control. There was no, it was no birth control, right. But I'll tell you this, those mothers hurt just the same. The difference was this, is their, their linear mind had to process as an process that pain in a way that society had programmed them. So the programming, the programming was a little different back then. And then as generations went by, I have recently come to find this out with the recent death of um, President Bush, 41, Barbara. I read somewhere that a few years ago, they lost a three-year-old daughter to leukemia mm -hmm. and she had either written in her book or on an interview uh, and she was young she was like I think I want to say in her mid-30s at the time that why she never dyed her hair this is really interesting story and I I hope I'm quoting it right so let me say I don't know if this is 100% but I'm, I'm close close on the mark she said after her daughter died within six weeks she went from having dark dark almost black hair to a full head of white hair and she showed pictures oh my. and she said it was the death of her daughter that caused her hair to go white and that by covering that up was not the way she was gonna honor her daughter wow well that wiped me out when i read that because as as a bereaved mother i understood now that had to have been i want to say probably in the late 50s early 60s i'm just guessing well that was that was a really bold way for her to deal with her. And that, that was a reflection of her as a woman and a mother. She wasn't having any of what was going on about coloring her hair as the first woman and all this business when her, her husband had long time been in politics. And first of all, that's a validation of the physical effects of what, what you know, the fact that any of us have any hair after our kids died is, is a miracle to me. Uh, that's a whole other topic. But it just goes to show you where society is at. So as we're coming along, we could go back and do a whole history on how mothers, excuse me, bless you, Stephanie, it's such a snowballing effect. And this just plays into the fact that this conversation has re reached a critical mass. It's a critical 
mass now, and we can't continue to do it the way we're doing it. And I don't care what religious dogma is out there. I don't care what political dogma is out there. Um, you know, in the United States right now, the bereavement laws vary from state to state. Now, I'm not an employment lawyer, but I've done a lot of research. And um, certain states, like the state of California and Oregon, are pretty liberal. They're some of the most liberal in the United States with their bereavement, parental bereavement time off whereas you can't get fired. And I think California's like five days, and I think Oregon might be seven or eight. And I'm here to tell you, Stephanie, Stephanie, you're in shock for about a year. So this concept of corporate America say we can't fire you, that whole conversation has to be really examined, and I'm opening a consulting division of my staffing company that's going to cater to that market and go in and do mindfulness trainings about what's really happening. Because education leads to compassion. With compassion comes solving of problems, resolution, and answers. But if you don't start with education, and this is where we're at right now, the fact that we don't even have a word shows that the death cooties is alive and well. No one wants to talk about it. They see you coming down the road and they go, here she comes, don't say anything about her kid. She, you know, don't upset her. And do you think for a minute that a bereaved mother forgets she had a child that died? I don't think so. So that just heaps on more stigma. There's a stigma that we have got to shatter. It's got to shatter in order to, to create more healing. And that's what my commitment and my body of work is all about. It's shattering through the stigma. But you know what? It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy, Stephanie. It's going to require some painful conversations. It is. Um, and we really haven't touched on this so far, Amy. But I do, I do want to bring this up because if we're going to have a new conversation, we have to be looking at things from a new direction. Mm -hmm. And I... Right. As you're talking and you're talking about all of these issues, I see the sphere of death, the death cooties, is part of our materialistic view of life. Yeah, And is. this is something that has amazed me throughout my life. I mean, the fact that when we're in grade school and in high school, we learn about atomic structure, we learn about energy, we learn about all kinds of things, but we don't absorb it into our concept of who we are and what we are and what's really going on. And so to me, a new conversation requires expanding our point of view. And it requires getting a bigger picture to try to understand everybody's afraid of death. Nobody wants to talk about it. It's the death cooties. It's the thing that nobody ever talked to me about it. When my father died, nobody talked to me about it. Right. I was told my dad was dead, and that was it. I went to the funeral, uh, but nobody talked to me about it. I was nine years old. Right, right, right. And it just was something that, you know, it just happens, I guess, and, and you just go on with life. Only you don't really go on with life. No, and see, that's the fallacy, your soul. Yeah, mm -hmm. all of that stuff is buried. And like all emotion that's buried, it continues to affect you in subtle ways. And not so subtle ways. And not so subtle ways. However, right. by the time, I want to say this, by the time my son died, mm -hmm. I already was aware of a spiritual dimension. I was well aware of it. And... When my daughter died uh, when at birth, that was devastating to me. And I almost feel like that was, and my father, I was very close to. So that was probably the greatest devastation of my life. Right, right. My whole life changed after he died. I mean, literally. Uh, right. In every way that you can imagine, we moved, you know, to a different place, etc. But... It almost felt like after my daughter died, it was like a training. So that when my son died, I was a little more prepared. Right, right. And right. I remember that the day that he died, I found out early in the morning. And I, I had some things happen. 
One was that I had a premonition six months, four months before. And some other things happened. But I spent that day, I had to drive to where my daughter was with a friend and tell her, and it was several hundred miles away, and because she was with her father, and I was very busy that day. I also had a five-year-old that I was had to deal with. And so when it came, so I was kind of in shock too. Mm-hmm. And when yeah, everybody, yeah, everybody yeah. went home and it was time to go to bed and I lay on my bed and I said, okay, this must be the point at which it hits me. <laughs> this must be the point at which I am just going to be devastated. And I don't know how I'm going to handle it. And so I laid on my bed and actually I felt peace. I felt an incredible peace come over me. And it continued for several days. That's nice. Much later, I connected with, you know, I really didn't know what happened. I knew the soul was eternal at that point. But I didn't know a lot about what happened. You know, if if our personality continues, if our intelligence and everything continues intact as we can represent as ourselves after we are passed over. And a couple of years later, I was very down. And um, another thing that happens after you lose someone, which happened to me, is your immune system goes down. Yeah, yeah. And I Big started one. developing some cancerous conditions in two different places. And I said, whoa, right. you know, I started reading on it. And I came to see that things like this happen usually within a couple of years after a profound loss. Right. And I said, I cannot continue this way. I have to figure this out because I still have children to take care of. Right. And I can't afford to be ill. Right. Right. And I ran into a person, a man online, who had had a near-death experience. And he subsequently could communicate with the other side. So he started telling me things about my son. And he gave me some pretty powerful validations. And... What I learned from that was what my son said was that he had stayed by me for three days. Yeah. Now he died on Good Friday. Okay. And I do recall that weekend was Easter weekend. And and it made a lot of sense to me in retrospect. But because I am very familiar with the big picture, shall we say, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I can feel a lot of energy comes in when you talk about someone. You were talking about Barbara Bush. I felt that overwhelming sense of energy around me. So there's someone here. But, and that may be a little bit difficult for some of our people to hear, but we are in a new conversation. So suspend disbelief. Absolutely. Suspend disbelief and listen, take it in. If it makes sense to you, if it resonates with you, fine. If it doesn't. Hold on to those pieces and just, you know, as you go through life, see where they fit in. Right. And all has to be together. This is a very important um, moment to pause what you're saying because it's so critical. You see, it's a complex. This is a very complicated topic because anytime you start talking about grief, the eternal life, you have to have the God conversation. When you have the God conversation, then it butts up against religion and then it's explosive. So what has to happen here is you've got to be able to do exactly what you said. You've got to look at this as almost a scientific from a quantum level of what happens when the physical body dies. I mean, I don't even like the word death. And so now when I say death, I just mean the body actually shuts down. Okay. And I do use the word dead when I'm talking because sometimes it's the quickest way I can communicate a concept that people know rather than transition or the OS because they don't know those terms. So I'm just like, okay, you think your son died, his body died. We know that. But when you start going on beyond that, that's when the fireworks start happening because you're up against 2,000 years of dog, and even some before that. And that's why this is a really new conversation because it takes commitment to healing. I had to bust through, Stephanie, paradigms that I had held to my whole life I thought were truths. Right. And in a blink of an eye, a blink of an eye, I found out 
they were wrong. My whole life, I thought I believed something about the afterlife and God. I was wrong. It wasn't truth what I was believing. It was what I believed. It was a belief, but it wasn't what I learned. And the minute I knew what I learned was wrong, then the answer presented itself. But that was when the healing started because the heart never lies. I was like, someone had put an oxygen mask on me because it was like the pieces of the puzzle were starting to come together. And I was committed to healing. After my son came to me in that vision early on and said, no mom, I will be very upset if you come here now because it's not your time. I knew that that was not an alternate plan for me. So I had to play by the rules and play nice in the sandbox. And I didn't want to upset him any more than we were already upset. So, and plus I was, un, I, I was shocked that I could start to communicate with him. And um, which is a whole other topic for a whole other show. But the point is, is the concept of suspending what you've grown up with to just merely be open. And I look at it this way. When you're a bereaved parent, your heart is shattered anyway. What a better time when the heart is open to allow it just to be open to new information. Because you're all shattered anyway. Your life is wrecked. You can't even, you can't even pretend it's not. You can't pretend that religion is going to be your panacea when you're in so much pain. It's going to help you. But you've got to start to look. This is the new conversation. Because if the old way worked, we would not have the grief pattern the way it's been going. Absolutely. Absolutely. It doesn't, doesn't have to be that way. No, it doesn't have to. You know, the thing that I ran into, and I started talking to a lot of people, uh, in my path in the last few years. But what I ran into is I would tell people, I would say, I lost a son and I'm not grief stricken. I'm happy. Mm -hmm. And they go, you're happy because your son died? I said, no, I'm just happy. Because, you know, I just have worked out, it, it, it's no longer seems to me a cause for grief. Correct. And they, one, often don't believe I've lost a child. <laughs> You didn't right. lose a child. You right, because it almost seems miraculous what you're talking about. Right, it just doesn't seem rational. And I right. think that part of it is we, we don't have a name for the mother who's lost a child. But the mother who's lost a child, holding on to the grief is part of your identity. We talk about a grief-stricken mother. Yes, yes. As opposed to a mother who's lost a child. It's a grief-stricken right. mother. Correct. And so that becomes your identity, your new identity that you must hold on to. Right. right. But as I say, no. when you are grief stricken, what use are you to anybody else in this world? And that's something to think about is well, that we, the other thing is, is, well, this is an, a whole other topic for a whole other show, but the grief portion of it, um, cause I understand that and I will validate that early on my grief was so overwhelming and I felt like if I wasn't grieving, then I, I lost my child. Like I lost that portion of the connection. I felt erroneously that if I had grief, I still had him. Oh, I was so wrong. I was so, so, so wrong. What I learned was when I started to release drop by drop by drop my grief, I could connect to him far more efficiently. And the grief was actually acting as a firewall that was keeping me in prison. It's also, I believe, a construct of the ego. Mm -hmm. And it's also a construct of some religions. I'm just going to say some, not all. Because mm -hmm. if they were to shift the rules now, then they'd realize the way they've been preaching about death would shatter their whole organization. And I'm just going to leave that at that. I won't right. go any farther. There's, there's, a, but, lot of, there's yeah. a lot of investment in the systems that we have. Yes, that's right. Exactly. And again, this is where the new conversation, you've got to be willing to get a little hot under the collar because as a Christian or as a Muslim or as a Buddhist or as an atheist or an agnostic, we got to come together and we all got to get a little uncomfortable because I am here to tell you from someone who's healed a little bit every day and I got a lot more to go. I would not be on this call right now at the rate I was. I'd be gone. 
whether my son wanted it or not, I couldn't have continued. The pain and my body was disintegrating, literally imploding. It was imploding day by day. Right. Sort of like me getting my cancer. Yes. But what yes. I mean to say too also, Amy, is that, you know, we're in this world for what? Why are we here? And I, here's my take on it. And this comes from, well, my connections and my experience, my personal experience, shall we say, with the other side, as I call it, the spiritual realm. Mm -hmm. We're here to experience love and to express love. Yeah. Yeah. And when we are grief stricken, you know, what happens with our child, other children? You know, our families, our extended families, our friends, if we're not, if we're so grief stricken and so caught up in it, it's difficult to be present. Well, Stephanie, it's not, it's not only difficult, it's impossible. Right. It's literally impossible to be present when you're grief stricken. Right. And I mean, I, I'll make that bold statement. Yeah. And so, you know, it's, it's, well, I don't know. We can talk about it more. We can talk about it later. I've been through it. You've been through it. Mine was a lot longer ago than yours. And so I've had a lot more time to process uh, and so we can, we can certainly as we go talk about more of these things but I guess that what I want to say is healing is possible it's possible and the journey and it's a journey it is oh, it definitely is. Is so worth the effort and I mean it's it's the hardest work I've done in my life like you know, I've had a very, very, very beautiful life in many ways, but like everyone else who lives to be of, you know, I'm not a young person, so we've all had our knocks, okay? Let's call it spade a spade. You don't get to be, you know, past middle age and not have, you know, bumped your knee a few times, okay? So um, I've had pain, but this was a whole new level. But now, let me just kind of map it out. It's been my experience that if your pain was a 10 on the Richter scale, when I have my moments of, I, let, let's, I don't want to use the word happiness, let's call it solace, or try to think of another word, and maybe that's another word. That's, there, there's something that has happened to me that is, negates, it erases the 10 on the Richter scale pain. It erodes it away step by step. And what's left, is such beauty that I've never, ever known. One of my favorite chapters in my book is called There's, um, The Death of Your Child is Your Greatest Gift. Well, when I wrote that three and a half years ago, I had no idea it would be more meaningful and true as my time has gone by. And what starts to happen is when you start even tiny bits of healing, if you allow yourself to see the gift, the gift has got your child's name all wrapped up in it. So you're not moving away from your child. You're moving into your child. And this is the nucleus of the new conversation because in many, many ways, I am way closer to my son now. Well, not in many ways. I am. And he's more present for me now than if he was alive in this life. Now, I'm still wrapping my head around that. But it's the truth has started to come. Right. And that healing you can't put. You just can't even put in words. And as a human being, days I can't even wrap my head around it. I have to just let it sit and be. Because it's something as linear human beings we were never taught to believe or know could be possible. Right. Right. There is so much out there when we open to it. It's just, you know, it's amazing when we start letting go of those old belief systems. And it's hard, Stephanie. And I, and I really feel for every bereaved parent because I was there. Right. And for me to let go was scary. It was scary. It was so, but my son was so adamant about leading the charge for me. And he could say, mom, you got to trust me on this one. Just trust me on this one. Just trust me. I'm not going to steer you wrong. And right. he didn't. He didn't. He didn't. 
but it was scary. It was scary for me because the grief was something I could identify with. I was comfortable with it. It had boundaries. I was raised with it. I knew what it looked like, but this was deeper. But I, 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 this was about as far as I was willing to go. I wasn't willing to look at anything new outside of the grief. And because of my son's prodding, I, t- I, I jumped off the God cliff. That's what I did. And he caught me. He caught me. And that's what, you know, the, the, the saying that goes with that is, you know, we tend to prefer the devil we know. Yeah, yeah, and exactly. Devil, you know, right. Sticking off that cliff into the dark. We'd rather stick with the devil we know than risk finding one we don't know. Exactly. And that keeps us from finding the bliss that we could know. And that also keeps society for non-bereaved community member, members, neighbors, countries, towns, globes in a safe spot. Because if they start communicating and then healing, that always requires a new shift. And it's easier just to pretend like seeing the lady walk down the street who you knew lost her child, pretend like you didn't see her. Oh, I'm on my phone. I didn't see her because then I don't have to look her in the eye. Right. And I get know, that. Yes, and you, you, you're just about out of time, but I want to say this because you have somehow miraculously segued right into what I would like to say, and that is our definition, the definition that I have, and that in my context with the spiritual realm have been validated over and over and over again. It's a, something that works. Our best definition of love is seeing and being seen. Just ask yourself, when somebody really sees me, what do I feel? When somebody really sees me without judgment, just sees me. That's when you fall in love. And, and, and our children in heaven or spirit, whatever word you want to put to it, um, they are the apex of that notion. They want to be seen so much in spirit they will pull out every stop to get your attention. They absolutely will. And I have told people that. I have done a lot of communication with the other side for people I help bring back through their loved ones. And I tell people that they want to they want to communicate with you every bit as much as you do with them. Oh, I think more. Yeah, and probably more because you're not aware of them and they're aware of you. They're aware and of they're, they get my son is shown me that they get frustrated. Even though they say there's no negative emotions, they remember negative emotions. So when my son communicates to me, he's frustrated when he's sending me messages and I didn't get them. He would say, mom, I'm frustrated. But what he wasn't saying his soul in heaven was frustrated at that moment. Let me be really clear. Um, But they remember what the human emotions were when they cross over. So he would right. remember and the frustration. You know, and, the, and we, well, my position is there are no negative emotions. There's just all motion. You know, just yeah. take it as it comes. And it's our resistance to it. The idea that some emotions are, you know, when you have grief, right. you can take it. You know, it's not a negative emotion. Frustration is not a negative emotion. It's just an emotion. You know, the, the magnet has two poles and neither one is better than the other. Right. And right. so... In my experience, I wouldn't want, you know, I, to me, the one thing that I, I was raised as a Catholic, and one thing that put me off from the very beginning was, I don't think I want to go to heaven with all the people that are going to heaven and sit on a cloud and play a harp for eternity. How boring. Right, right, You right. know, if you don't have emotion there, if you cannot move, you don't have energy and motion then how boring that would be to me to sit, you know, bliss is fine, but you know, every once in a while I want to jump in the water and <laughs> get a little thrill. And they, and they have a lot of thrills. Trust yeah. me. They have, they have more thrills than you have no idea. There's so much going on up there. Again, that's the topic for, you know, three years worth of shows, but um, it's not what people think it is. Right. I'll and just everybody has a different perspective on it, you know, I guess. And we're all working there's levels of understanding, levels of growth, levels of evolution. It's like the onion, you know, you can peel off layers. Yes. Yes. Trying to get down to the heart of it, but it's just layer after layer after layer. And I, um, you know, and, and so sharing our experiences helps us put the puzzle together. There is truth. There is, the, the puzzles do fit together. If there wasn't truth, our bridges would fall down, as I say. Exactly. 
You know, exactly. if, if four plus four doesn't always equal eight, all of our mathematics, we could throw it out the window. You know, four plus four doesn't equal nine sometimes and 10 sometimes. There's consistency. Right. And within that consistency, there is a truth. There is an indication that, that, that everything fits together. It's supposed to fit together. And if we can figure out, it's just a matter of figuring out how it fits together, how it works, what, what parts go, and that's what a lot of our scientists have been working on forever, right? Well, and there's going to be a whole lot of new information coming out, Stephanie, and this is a great time for us to wrap up uh, because I do a lot of studying on what's coming down. And modern technology is now able to measure things in the quantum field they could never measure before. And so we are going to start to see over the next few years, science, scientific community, understanding what happens to the soul. They can measure the soul. They know how the soul exits the body. Um, I mean, and this is all because of technology. So it's going to, they're now going to have the facts that they never had even two or three or four years ago. And I've been doing a huge amount of research on this and it's so exciting, but realize one thing and, and, and I want to say this to whoever would possibly watch this or ends up watching this. The, the opinions of mine and the experience of mine is just every mother who loses a child, their relationship is so unique and their journey will be unique too. So everything that I'm saying is just between what's happened between me and my son. But what I do believe firmly is, is that if it's happening to me, it's also happening in different ways, but the same process to other mothers. So we have to understand that everything I say is not to be taken as gospel. Every mother might say, you know, it didn't work like this for me, but it kind of worked like this, but the outcome was the same. Fabulous. Because now we're all having the conversation right. and no one wins. No one loses. I'm not right. right. I'm not wrong. <laughs> there is no right. wrong. This is just, let's get it going. Because again, education, compassion, healing. I, I will tell you that's the way it worked for me. Right. Well, I'm all for it. I'm all for dialogue. You know, let's dialogue. Let's not argue. Let's not debate. Let's dialogue. Let's share our experience. Let's share our thoughts. Let's find what resonates with us. Let's, you know, tap on some of those calcified beliefs. Yeah. Maybe yeah. Knock a little of the dust off them. Yeah. And even better when the tears start to flow, because then you got a nerve. You hit a nerve. Right. And, and, and when those, those tears come out, you're releasing grief. Trust you me. You're releasing energy, that stored up energy. So we're going to say to goodbye for today. If you, okay. Um, we'll, we'll provide some contact information. So if okay, any of our listeners have uh, topics that they'd like us to discuss, please contact us and let us know. Beautiful. Thanks, Amy, for joining me today. Thank you, Stephanie, for, for, for being part of the new conversation. And the children in heaven, they're, they're really happy right now. I will tell you that. They are really happy. And I can feel, as I said, I can feel energy. And so I felt quite a bit of it through this session. I love that. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Okay, bye.